<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Nick Taylor Horror Show. King Cohen is a fantastically fun and uh, really, really great documentary. It tells the larger than life story of Larry Cohen. So Larry Cohen was a writer and director, and uh, he was the guy behind a bunch of beloved horror cult classics like It's Alive, The Stuff, and Q, The Winged Serpent. In addition to being a really, really fun documentary, it... um, it really shows a portrait of a irrepressible artist. Throughout the course of his career, Larry Cohen was a guy who just would not take no for an answer. I mean, it's a cliche statement that gets thrown around a lot, but literally this guy could not be told no. He broke every rule in the book. He seemed to have invented guerrilla filmmaking or, if anything, just took it to a completely higher degree. And the lengths that he would go to protect his artistic integrity and the vision that he had and to make the movies that he wanted were insanely ambitious and, in some cases, completely and totally nuts. Overall, Larry Cohen's iron will and resourcefulness is best articulated through his exploration of guerrilla filmmaking techniques, which are outrageous, fascinating, and, in some cases, completely reckless. There's one shot where... Larry Cohen had a taxi cab driving down a sidewalk in New York City at full speed in the middle of the day with no permits. So there's actual New Yorkers walking down the sidewalk, and to get the shot that he wanted, he had a taxi cab drive down the sidewalk. No permits. Somehow, he never went to jail. But despite the danger and recklessness of a lot of these instances that are shown in this documentary, the philosophies behind his guerrilla filmmaking approach are infectiously inspiring. And... In this regard, the movie's really a priceless how-to guide for aspiring and, in some cases, daring genre filmmakers. So anybody who is an aspiring filmmaker, this is a must-watch. There's a lot of lessons in guerrilla filmmaking and low-budget filmmaking, and, and it's a worthwhile watch, if only for just that. But in addition to that, it is a fantastically fun documentary, and it's got a lot of great guests. It kicks off with J.J. Abrams, and then John Landis is in it, as well as Joe Dante, Martin Scorsese, Rick Baker, Mick Garris, Ryan Turek, and there's a particularly hysterical exchange between Fred Williamson and (laughs) and Larry Cohen. It's it's really a fun watch, and it's a special treat for horror fans. But uh, we luckily were able to speak with the director of King Cohen, Steve Mitchell, You may know Steve as the writer of Chopping Mall. I really, on a personal level, got a lot out of hearing how he was able to make this movie and uh, the overall directorial journey behind it. So anyway, without further ado, here is documentary filmmaker Steve Mitchell. From the start, how did this project come about? How did you come to do this documentary about uh, Mr. Cohen? Well, I was working at Image Entertainment doing uh, DVD special features, uh, commentaries and stuff like that. And I remember one day, uh, for some reason, I'm not entirely sure why, you know, these years later, that uh, I was looking up Larry's IMDb page and and what struck me, and I knew Larry's credits pretty well. I was a fan of his work and Mm -hmm. uh, I was aware of his TV work as well, uh, to one degree or another but I was surprised by the amount of movies that were in his filmography that I didn't know. And then I also kind of realized, I don't know why I did before, but what was interesting about Larry's career is while he was busy doing his Larco movies, more or less independently, uh, even though a lot of the checks came from studios or distributors to finance the pictures, Mm -hmm. He was making them very independently. He was making them, you know, Larry's way. Um, He was also doing a lot of mainstream work at the same time. And I said, you know, I don't know if anybody that I'm aware of has ever had a career quite like his. And I think that's kind of where the genesis of the idea uh, took hold. Mm -hmm. And um, it took a while to get us, uh, you know, uh, in production, you know, getting, getting any movie financed is, uh, 
it's a tough road. I mean, I right. tried crowdfunding. And I said, oh, this is great. You know, you, you put your trailer up and you, you know, offer them posters and T-shirts or, you know, coffee cups. And then they give you money and you make your movie. Well, I was spectacularly bad at it, and I didn't know anything. <laughs> what did you about try? Kickstarter? Uh, I think it was working Indiegogo. Okay. Um, and, but yeah, I think there's a whole skill set to that that I was completely unaware of. But the idea, you know, didn't want to go away. It was, you know, it, it uh, the idea that was just always in the back of my mind. And then eventually, uh, I had the very good fortune of meeting Matt Verboys, who was one of the co-owners of La La Land Records, mm-hmm. a soundtrack label that I was a customer of. I, you know, I bought a lot of their stuff because I'm a film music fan. Uh, we met at Comic Con, and I was introduced to him, and he said, "Are you the Steve Mitchell that co-wrote Chopping Mall?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, said, Man, I love Chopping Mall." Whoa. And and I said I said wow okay all these years later nice to get a little shout out and a curtain call and That's cool. so we became pals I mean we were kindred spirits we liked a lot of the same movies we got to know each other socially and at one point I think he had said that he and his partner had been toying around with doing things other than just music mm-hmm. and you know just my head is made out of cream cheese it took a while for it to penetrate but I said yeah maybe Matt might be the guy. Hmm. And so we had lunch. I mentioned I wanted to do a documentary about Larry Cohen, and he said he was already interested uh, the second I finished the N in Cohen. And then by the <laughs> and really by the end of the lunch, he said, well, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it. And he was, you know, he was right, and here we are, uh, albeit a couple of years later. Very cool. Documentaries are typically really subjective where people will see them and they'll extract their own meanings. And I I feel like that's a sign of good documentaries. But from your perspective, what was the kind of core story that was at the heart of King Cohen? Like, what was your kind of major takeaway? Well, the thing about documentaries is that there is no script. You don't pre-plan it and then go out and get it. Right. Uh, you know, maybe Ken Burns, Ken Burns does on some level, but he's, he's telling uh, or retelling uh, history. Mm-hmm. I'm basically creating a portrait of a character. And I knew that Larry's filmography would be interesting. I had listened to him enough on commentary tracks. I had listened to him enough, uh, you know, in feature ads. I'd read, uh, somebody wrote a book about him. I think it was a McFarlane or Scarecrow press book about him quite a few years ago. And so I said, this guy is interesting, but you don't know how interesting somebody is until you actually meet them and you talk with them Mm -hmm. and you discuss, you know, their career and you interview them. So what came my, my big takeaway, and this is, I got this pretty quickly was that Larry was an interesting character, not just an interesting filmmaker from a, a, you know, a, from a credit standpoint, you know, Mm -hmm. the amount of, you know, scripts that he wrote, the amount of movies that he made, but he was an interesting character, you know, starting out with being a performer and, you know, and, and doing standup. So the, the performer DNA uh, was there from an early age and is still there many, many years later. So getting to know Larry was interesting. Uh, but I had no, I had no idea what the form of the movie was going to be other than I used the spine of his career, uh, basically to hang, uh, aspects of who he was. I mean, what, what happened was after we did all the interviews with him and then the interviews with everybody else, but mostly the interviews with him, I said, okay, my idea here is to create a portrait of an idiosyncratic creative filmmaker and writer using his career as certain chapters or, or examples along the way. Mm -hmm. Every time I I focused on a film, it wasn't like, Oh, and then he did this and oh, and then, and and that's fine. But what we tried to do, uh, my editor, Kai Thomasian and I tried to do, but Kai and I, basically said we're going to try and use each film that we cover or each example that we use 
to try and reveal something about who Larry is. And that was essentially our script. You know, we were, mm-hmm. we were using the spine of his career to build a portrait of who he is. Now, Larry, of course, is giving me a very hard time because Larry's very blunt and <laughs> I've been hammered by him more than once, generally <laughs> lovingly, but still, uh, he says, why did you cover my theater stuff? Why did you do this? Oh, more anecd- I gave you anecdotes about this. That's my bad Larry impersonation, <laughs> by the way. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, Larry, I'm making a movie here, you know, and he says, you make a mini series. And, and we use that as a kind of a, a joke at the end of the picture anyway. Um, but my feeling is that I'd rather give them the best I could do and want people to want more than to just go. And then by 1989, he did this. Right. And, and, you know, sadly, and I said this to my editor, I said, in the beginning, I said, you, you know, I said, Ty, you know, you've got ADD and I've got ADD. And he said, and he protested that. And I said, no, really, we all have attention deficit disorder. It's the whole nature of the 21st century. Um, and it's because of all of the information that he's thrown at us, you know, we're always looking for something new, 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 what, you know, it's that, you know, crazy puppy syndrome. What, what, where, what, where? <laughs> And, and so we had to sort of make it very as uh, efficient as we could, as economical as we could, and always give the audience something to look at, to absorb, to listen to, um, you know, that's why the clips are not terribly long. We always tried to find the clips that were best suited to making the point about the movie or what Larry tried to do, but you know, a lot of older documentaries, they will give you a fair amount of clip and then cut them to something, something else or something different. Uh, and we didn't want to do that. We always wanted to, can you, you know, we wanted to have this sort of almost musical rhythm with the clips and the stills and the interviews that we were always going to something new. Now I didn't cut it like I was, you know, a monkey on caffeine and cocaine and sugar. <laughs> um, but you'll notice that the movie has very, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it moves briskly along. Right. And that was our concern. That's another thing with most filmmakers today. Is you have to be concerned with how the audience is going to absorb the material. Hmm. And then, and then lastly, we tried to, as best we could make everything that we put in different from something else that was in the picture. We tried not to be repetitious. Right. Uh, and, and when you have as much raw footage as we did, uh, that it's not a problem, but it, it can be an issue. You know, you know, you just go, what, what, what did he say that day without that movie? And didn't we use that? You know, there's, there's a lot of that. Mm. There's a lot of that, you know, trying to take stock of, I, I know I'm meandering with this answer. I'm trying to take mm. stock with everything that you've shot and try and make some sense out of it is what right. I'm trying to say. So it sounds like it was you were really strategic in how you edited it. And I think there's something really interesting about the idea of using every single movie as a way to reveal something different about Larry to the point where collectively you paint this very large portrait of this very fascinating person. So that that I think was pretty interesting. Did you arrive at well, that? Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, well, I'm glad you feel that way. I mean, because I've, I've actually had some criticism that you know, I, I sort of went from A to Z, but the idea was not just to tell the, the, I mean, the chronology of someone's life will help tell your story. The chronology of someone's life shows what they were like when they were young and maybe silly or stupid or full of beans or whatever. And then when they get to the latter part of their career, you see a certain amount of wisdom based on experience, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Uh, in my case, two things, two interesting things happen. One, Larry still the, the same crazy madman that he was when he was young mentally. He's still the same creative uh, person with tons of ideas as he was. Mm-hmm. Um, I know a lot of writers. I'm a writer myself. And I think every writer has X amount of stories within them. I don't see that with Larry. And that's something that never changed. And you, you can only sort of come to that if you go chronologically. Right. And then lastly, the other thing that happened was that, and this is, this is partly because of Martin Scorsese contributing to the picture. Um, 
but it just it was a it was again a cumulative effect that occurs. You know, if you look at his career and you watch how it progressed, is that he represents a certain time and a certain era of filmmaking. You know, uh, Martin Scorsese talks about the renegade spirit. Right. Well, that's certainly part of it, but in a larger sense, there's also there was a time when movies would get made and find their way into movie theaters. I often would see sometimes on Broadway at big houses, these big houses that used to play a pictures every once in a while, a picture from AIP or crown or uh, dimension or, you know, the early version of new line cinema. Uh, what would happen is some of these drive-in type movies would wind up getting into these a theaters because the a picture was painting. And so, because it was Times Square, they, you know, I, mean, I remember seeing a woman's prison picture at the Rivoli Theater on Broadway, which was a huge, huge uh, single-screen house it's where Jaws played like forever. And I think they just said, well, we're going to get a bunch of people to come and watch you know, naked women in prison and sell some popcorn. So, if the movies got made and they were made reasonably well, they got into a theater and Larry was part of that universe. You know, he made these movies and they, you know, uh, got into the theaters. His pictures came from AIP and new line and new world. Um, and what happened was he had a chance for people to see them as he used to see movies. That's the other thing. I, huh. I really wanted to show the connection of Larry and a movie theater from his early days. That was one of the reasons also why we did that. Right. It, and so Larry's always complaining, oh, nobody's ever going to see it on streaming. Who knows? What is that? Well, <laughs> I can't I can't entirely answer him on that. I mean, I know what streaming is. I mean, I stream stuff and I watch stuff on cable, but, mm -hmm. you know, BOD and people watching stuff on iTunes, that's a whole new world to me. And, you know, I say to Larry, you should just be happy that people are going to see this movie one way or the other. Right. And but but Larry's old school. You know, his, his idea of a movie should be seen in the theater. And to sort of shamelessly self-promote, one of the things that's also been a great experience with Jake Cohen, and we got this when we were doing our festival track, was we realized that the movie plays very well with an audience. Mm. Now, I don't, I don't, I'm assuming you watched it at home alone or maybe with one or two friends. Yep. But this movie plays very well with an audience, which pleases me a great deal because in a sense i think i want larry to find an audience as 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 a person the way larry's movies found an audience in the filmmaker. yeah and I'm, i know i went probably way off off track with that answer but there you are no you probably um i think you, you answered about three other questions now so it's all good oh, okay uh yeah i, I when I, I i find myself constantly watching movies either on streaming or at home or whatever and um, always wondering, what would that experience have been like in a movie theater? And when you said that it plays well with a crowd, it reminds me, I saw Supermensch at South by Southwest a couple of years ago before anybody was even talking about it. I didn't even hear of it. I kind of stumbled into it. And it was so mm -hmm. much fun. And Mike Myers and Shep Gordon were all there. But it was probably the most riotous crowd I'd ever watched a documentary with. You know, I mean, you've seen Supermensch, I assume, right? I have not actually, oh. but it's now on my it's now on my to see list. Oh, you put that already. towards the top. It, it's funny because King Cohen reminded me a lot of it. It's just this portrait of these larger than life characters who have these very prolific careers. In the case of Shep Gordon, it was movies and music, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of parallels in there. Um, I mean, for me, one of the one of the the big kind of takeaways that I had was just how remarkably irrepressible he was where you had this guy who oh, just yeah. could not be told what to do, would not be stopped. And it was, I mean, tremendous. It was humorous, but also tremendously inspirational. And um, he was able to circumvent the Hollywood system in these genius ways where he started out as a writer and then the directors were fucking with his writing to the point where he's like, all right, I'm going to become a director to protect my writing. And then he became a producer to protect his directing. I mean, this was a guy who just, he, he could not be contained in, in any way. And I've, I've never, it's rare to see such a burning artist, but also one who's got such resourcefulness. Um, 
On the other end, it was a really interesting kind of film school in guerrilla filmmaking to the degree, potentially somewhat as a cautionary tale, but also just the sense of like, get the shot, always, just always get the shot. So, I mean, again, just to reemphasize, I really, really enjoyed it. I got, I got a whole lot out of it. It was, uh, it was a lot, a lot of fun. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm glad that you did. And just, well, I don't know if there was a technical question in there. I will respond to the fact that Larry is a force of nature. He is very strong willed. He is relentless in his pursuit of anything. I mean, he does not concede anything in a discussion. You know, he's right and he's going to, you know, uh, use his uh, battering ram intelligence to, to whip you into submission. Now, every once in a while, he and I have really butted heads as movie fans. Mm. And I've had, and I've had the temerity to uh, disagree with him. And he says, if I want you to disagree with me, I tell you to, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and we all had a big, big chuckle over it. But, you know, part of what, part of why Larry's movies are Larry's movies is that he would not, not accept the idea of not being able to do something, especially if someone told him he can't do something. Right. Um, now, part of that is ego. I think part of it might be narcissism. Part of it might be that he was very successful when he was young. And so I think he had the ability to not worry about work and money. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've never really mentioned this before, but I'll just say that if you don't have to worry about making a living, you tend to sort of do what you want to do. Right. Um, and I, and I think that he, I mean, the famous house, I think he bought the famous house when he was doing television in the sixties mm -hmm. and you know, he's still in that house. Um, but, but the thing is that Larry never worried about anything other than getting the movie made absolutely the best way he thought he could make it. Mm -hmm. And that included not prepping. It included, and this is one of his superpowers, the ability to think on his feet in the moment on a location mm. to take advantage of something in the moment and say, all right, let's get out. You know, and he, he always, uh, his early seventies movies were made very uh, compactly in that, I think he hired two checker cabs back in the day. One was for him and I guess maybe some of the actors and the other one was for crew and gear. Okay. But he had a very, very tight little filmmaking unit when he was making a lot of those movies and he would run around and say, all right, let's go shoot here. Boom. And you know, you can do that today because of the equipment. I mean, I shot some of King Cohen with my smartphone. Oh, really? Yeah. And what happens is that you have the technology at your fingertips so that you can, you can make films and television and shorts and YouTube stuff. And God knows what else uh, with very little gear, but you have to have the ability to know how you can do something on the fly that will serve the story that you're telling. Right. And part of, Part of what makes Larry's movies interesting is, especially Hell Up in Harlem, because he just he was just running around New York City, you know, like a crazy man, just shooting stuff where, when and where he wanted. I mean, I don't know that the movie makes a whole lot of sense, but that's partly why it's so damn enjoyable. Yeah. Um, Black Caesar was actually a script. He had had a script, but Hell Up in Harlem, he was making up mostly on the fly that's because he's Larry Cohen. I don't know that I could do that. I don't know if you could do that. I don't know if the person listening to this conversation or reading an interview, this, in, this interview would say, Oh yeah, I can do that. Right. I mean, Larry is unique in that he was able to sort of think on his feet the way he could. Right. And that's primarily because he's a writer. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you kind of touched on this before, but I'm sure that the wealth of material was overwhelming, probably what you both what you shot and what you could have shot. Um, obviously, there's enough about Larry Cohen's life to fill like a 10 hour Ken Burns special if you really wanted to. But um, what was how did you approach 
putting putting this into a feature length documentary. In other words, what were some of the most painful things to cut and what were the kind of, I guess, key themes that you wanted to organize the film around? Yeah, well, the key scenes that I wanted to organize the film around are pretty much in the film. Mm -hmm. I, of course, I had, I think I had 15 hours of footage with Larry alone, at <laughs> least. We did, I think, three kind of marathon interview sessions with him. I did a couple of days of B-roll at the house. I did a couple of interviews with him when I was shooting somebody else. Of course, I followed him around at Horror Hound for three days, uh, just grabbing stuff. Um, and then, of course, there were all the other people that I talked to on top of that. I mean, I had a lot of raw footage. I had a lot of it. And there are a number of great stories that I couldn't use because Larry has a tendency to be somewhat long-winded with his answers. You know, he speaks <laughs> kind of in run-on sentences and says everything twice. Now, that's not a bad thing per se because I've interviewed people where, you know, you're sitting there trying to drag stuff out of them because they just don't have anything to say. Uh, or they don't have anything compelling to say or interesting to say. Now, part of that as an interviewer and as a filmmaker is always my fault. If I don't get something, then then that's my fault. Because my job, and this is something that, that I've learned over the years, is that being a good documentary filmmaker means being a good interviewer. It means being sort of good journalist. It means trying to extract answers in English that mostly form sentences because mm. that's how I cut. I tend to never cut in the middle of a sentence unless there's an idea in the middle of that sentence where I go, okay, now, you know, I just want to just jump to something, you know, something else like the, the whole sequence where Larry and Fred Williamson are having that. He said, he said sequence, you that know, hilarious, that, by the way. Uh, yeah, we cut that pretty early, and I said to my editor, I said, yeah, you know, whenever we can do funny, let's let's do funny. And, and there's no answer to this story. Is it is is it true? Is it bullshit? Is it, you know, is it their egos at work? It's sort of, it's all of the above. Yeah. But the audience has to make that decision. I don't, I'm not making that decision for them. And, but there's so much, there's so much you have to be, as a filmmaker, when you do a documentary, it's not, you're not just a guy with a camera. That's a, that's what a cameraman does. You know, if this is skewed towards people who want to do this work, I'm, yep. I, I really want to emphasize that, you know, when I, I didn't take a writing credit for the movie, but there, I essentially wrote the movie. I wrote it in the editing room. I also, but I also created hundreds and hundreds of questions with tremendous attention to detail whenever I could to try and extract the most interesting answers. I mean, I just got finished producing uh, some Blu-ray special features for a movie. And I remember going to the editor's house and I took out my questions and he said, really, you're going to ask me all those questions? Cause I think there was about 60 questions. Oof. which is not an inconsequential amount of, of, of questioning. Also, and again, as a filmmaker trying to do this, you have to listen because there is a question in someone's answer. You know, mm. listen for the, listen to the answer because there might be a follow-up. Now, it may, you know, knock out a couple of questions that you were going to ask down the line, like you said that I'd answered a couple of yours, but you have to be prepared for that sort of thing because once you leave, especially if you do this kind of filmmaking can't, re I mean, I was able to go back to Larry cause Larry was going to help me any way I could. So I was able to, you know, go up and get some follow-ups that I needed when we were cutting. But your job is to, is to be a storyteller in terms of getting the story, not making the story. There's a difference, right? But getting the story out of the people that you're talking to. And, you know, some days that's easier than others. With Larry, it was a breeze. I mean, the first day we shot with Larry, we picked an angle, we lit it, we sat him down, we hooked him up. I asked him my first question, and then he was off to the races. 
Hmm. I could have gone out for a three hour lunch and come back and you still would have been talking. <laughs> That's just getting lucky. Right. But then sometimes you interview people, famous people, interesting people, and you can't get two or three really interesting thoughts or sentences from them. And I won't tell you who those people were, but, <laughs> um, so you have to be able to, you have to be prepared for that as well. You know, when you're doing a documentary, unlike the way Larry did stuff, or Larry could write the movie as he was shooting it, uh, you have to really be prepared. And you have to really, really work on what I call the hunting and gathering of information. Okay. Because always, here's the thing I learned in film school years ago. First thing, one of the first things I learned in film school 100 years ago, which was, what are you going to cut to? Which is a pretty good question. It's a simple question, but it's a mm-hmm. good question. Now, I was I was very fortunate that I had plenty of other people. Uh, somebody said in a review that I kind of cross-examined Larry in many ways because I was always coming to other people who had thoughts about him and stuff. And I, I don't know that that was intentional, but I thought that was interesting. But you have to ha- have those people to cut to, or you have to have clips, or luckily, thank God Larry never threw anything away. I had so much great coverage of him on set you know all of those images of him on set even in the early tv days I mean, as, a, as a fan i'm going oh, this is great you know but that's the thing that you do when you make one of these things you always have to know cutting to something and you have to have plenty to cut to okay uh, so there you go there you go with that one great just wasting <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if we could shift gears a little bit, could you go mm-hmm. into more details in terms of what it takes to get a documentary off the ground from scratch, like from initial idea to final cut and the film's done, it's picked up, it's being distributed. What do documentarians need to know if they want to enter this business? And what were your key learnings well, to the process? To, to, be the most, to, be, to be the most cynical, it's great if you know people who have money. Yep. Um, no one wants to write a check in the film business. No one. When I was at Image and I had the idea initially, I went to the guys in the front office and I said, I got this idea for this Larry Cohen documentary. And these guys were somewhat film literate, but they were business guys. And they said, oh, it sounds really interesting. Why don't you make it and bring it back and maybe we'll acquire it? Hmm. Well, that's the first big lesson you have to learn is that people want you to spend $10 and then they'll pay you $1 for it. And so money is a big deal. I mean, right now my partners and I are trying to raise money for another one of my projects. Um, and, and even though, you know, King Cohen has got great response, we're not relying on the ability to go into a room someplace and getting into those rooms is very hard, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, to say, hey, I want to do, I want to do a project about this. Um, sometimes they'll say, that's great. Yes, we want, we want to do it. Then they'll write you a check, or you still have to do it from from the ground up, which is the way we may be doing my next project. Which, um, you know, I'm going. Well, I'd like to get paid for this one. I mean, I did get paid, but the, the amount of money I made over two years wasn't very good. And my partners make even less. You know, this is hard work. This is work. Plumbers make more money than I do. Electricians make more money than I do. I mean, people say, what advice would you give to a young filmmaker? I would say, don't get in the business. <laughs> Seriously. Right. Now, do a trade or a vocation that will make you a good living. And then you can live comfortably, have a 70-inch television set. You know, you can have a man cave if you like and recliners and stuff and you can enjoy movies and never lose the love for movies. Show business is very difficult. And money is an incredibly key component. Uh, the problem is that everybody tries to think, well, if I do something I don't really care about, maybe someone will write a check. I mean, I've, tried, I've written some scripts like that in the past where I go, well, maybe this will sell. And then I never finished those scripts. I never gave a shit. Right. Um, and the thing about the thing about King Cohen, one of my best friends, and I didn't remind him of this because he saw the movie recently and he, and, he, and he really enjoyed it. But he told me, he said, he said, Steve, 
think anybody really gives a shit about Larry Cohen. This is, this was in the beginning. Hmm. And I said, yeah, I do. I'm the audience. If I find it, if, if I think it can be interesting to me, then I know it can be interesting to other people. So you always have to self determine the pro- project based on your enthusiasm for the material and or the subject, because this is a marathon. Yeah. This is not a sprint. You know, somebody can sit and write a B movie script. And I have friends who are B movie filmmakers. They can write a script in three weeks. Well, that's a sprint, but a real movie is a marathon. It is, it is, takes a long time. King Cohen took a long time for two reasons. One, we weren't in a hurry. So the whole idea was to create the best movie we possibly could, because this, for me, this is my first feature in a portfolio piece. Right. And our investors were pretty cool about that. So we took longer than we wanted to, but because we took longer, we got a couple of extra things that we were able to put in it because we, we weren't in a hurry. Hmm. But if you're, if you're a young filmmaker, even not a young filmmaker, you know, money is a big issue. Being interested in the project over the course of the life of the project is a big issue. You know, maintaining your interest because if your interest lags, I, I remember interviewing a director about a movie and he just said, yeah, at a certain point I got bored with it. Well, you know, I think I could feel that in the picture. You hmm. can't allow yourself to be bored while you're making a movie. And I don't give a shit whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Because I tell you something, you have to have the same level of enthusiasm for nonfiction that you have for fiction. I always say that the secret to doing any storytelling is always, at its heart, great characters. Hmm. Larry Cohen is a great character. For sure. And luckily, he was surrounded by other great characters. Moriarty, Yaffet, Fred Williams, Mm-hmm. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that all contributes to getting through the project. But you also, it's not about just making it. I have a director friend who thinks if he shoots it and it cuts and it's bound and it's a color, it's a good movie. Which, as my friend, I don't say to him, that's bullshit. <laughs> you know, it's, this, is, this kind of work is too damn hard not to put all your energy and passion into a picture. That's yeah. one of the big takeaways of this, of, of doing this movie was for me that I never stopped caring about what I was doing. Hmm. You can't just make it. You, right. know, you can't just assemble it. You know, great movies, at least the movies that I think are great movies are always made by somebody who was, you know, I don't think of myself an art as an artist, but I do think of, I, I'm a big fan of craft. Mm-hmm. crafting your story, telling your story well. And I think that's a very, that's, that's a big decision that anybody has to make before they embark on any project, much less a documentary project. Great. Um, is it accurate to say that, um, and we talked about this a little bit earlier. I just wanted to reemphasize that you pretty much did want to paint a portrait of this character and a lot of the ways and a lot of the kind of mini stories you discovered after you kind of started filming. Is that accurate? Mm-hmm. Like you kind of had an initial idea and an initial agenda in terms of what you wanted to capture about Larry and about his life. But as you filmed, did the, how significantly did the, did the, the final product shift from your original conception of it? Uh, well, my original conception was more than I, an overall idea. It wasn't, you know, engraved in stone. Okay. But what happens is things evolve. Uh, for example, I didn't know it was going to be quite as funny as it is. Hmm. Uh, but that's okay. I went with that because that went to who Larry was. I mean, the thing is that the only time I think you got something happened with the movie, and this is in a good way, that I had not originally sort of thought about or discussed. And as you can tell, I can talk forever uh, with my editor, because I think of my editor as my co-writer, mm-hmm. was that we were also creating a portrait of a certain time of filmmaking. Mm. We, you know, I touched on this earlier, you know, where Martin Scorsese talks about, I miss the times, I miss the spirit, the renegade spirit. Um, this is also a tribute to a certain time of filmmaking 
that doesn't exist anymore. The hilarious thing is, you know, you can go out and get a couple of get a couple of very portable lights. Take your smartphone. You can actually uh, that you can attach lenses to it, mm-hmm. and you can have a pretty much complete lighting and camera package today, which is so mobile and so relatively inexpensive that you can go out and shoot anything. And I think to some degree in Larry's days, there was some of that, but the, the trick, and I think the tribute to what Larry's movies were, was they were always about something. There were ideas at work. Uh-huh. You know, I don't like all of his movies. I like most of his movies. Uh, a couple of them, I think are downright awful, <laughs> but almost all of them can, they, they can't be considered empty calories. Right. You know, there's, there's, there's something in, 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 in the movie beyond what you're just, just the, the movement that you take away from Larry's pictures. And I think a lot of movies today, which are spectacularly well made, I mean, you, you know, look, I couldn't have made King Cohen as well as I did without, you know, digital technology. You know, a movie like mine, if I tried to make this 30 years ago, I might have shot it 16 millimeter and, I would have been doing lots of cutting and pasting and all of that stuff. And, uh-huh. you know, God knows how awful it would have been. Right. But, you know, King Cohen is cut with, with micro attention to every cut, you know, and that's because digital makes cutting, you know, technically very easy. Right. So that helps. But the thing is that movies today, not all movies, but a lot of movies today are influenced by technology what older movies were influenced by, and this is true with Larry's pictures, is they were influenced by art. They were influenced by politics, uh, you know, polit- you know, like national political politics, pop cultural politics, sexual politics. Mm-hmm. And they were influenced, and in many ways, influenced by art. Yeah. You know, movies are not influenced by art today, for the most part. You see a Christopher Nolan movie, you know, a movie like Dunkirk. I would say that that was that was influenced by art in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. Yeah, he but, looked at a lot of Francis know, Martin, Bacon for uh, for the the Dark Knight. Yeah, you know, uh, Martin Scorsese, I think, is still influenced by art and by life. That's the other thing. Life. Look at life. A lot of filmmakers today, they don't know shit about life. <laughs> they really don't. And it's a knock. Yes, but it's more really a knock in, as, as an observation than anything else. I got you. That, that, that movies, you know, move, you, know, you know, movies aren't, listen, I go see a lot of movies and I go, that wasn't bad, but I don't take it home with me. You know, think about as a movie guy of all the two and a half star movies that you saw back in the day, whenever the day was. Uh-huh. And you go, that, that's a good movie. I like that movie. That's a two and a half star movie. Two and a half star movie today is something you would never look at again. Right. And, and there was something there was something about the reality of film and life that existed. You know, I, Martin Scorsese refers to it as cinema. Mm-hmm. That cinema was reflective of a time and a place at that time and in that place. Hmm. And movies today aren't in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I think, you know, even Larry's movies were reflective of times and places and ideas. And that's why I think I think his movies hold up. He's also a genre filmmaker and genre movies for some reason endure far better than say mainstream movies. Yeah. Yeah, I think you hit you on know. something that's really particularly relevant right now and in today's zeitgeist is the fact that we are moving away from cinema when you're watching movies and I think that's because like you said um, movies are not inspired by art anymore and cinema doesn't have, I, I think there's a huge difference between movies as a notion and then the idea of cinema and Scorsese still does it. Tarantino obviously adheres to it better than anyone, but I do think that the reason that we're seeing such a huge interest in nostalgia in like everywhere, like this throwback feel to to the 70s and the 80s, the biggest examples, probably Stranger Things, people want that sense of culture that a lot of movies don't have anymore i mean there were kind of time stamps that the 70s and the 80s and even the 90s to an extent had and then it just movies lacked the signature and they didn't feel like they were part of any particular era and i think that 
a lot of people are, are returning to that. The Guardians of the Galaxy movies were a perfect example. They have this throwback you feel, and I think that more people are gravitating towards that. Um, and Yeah, and I, I think that that's pretty interesting. Well, i tell you something. The three most special effects of all for audiences, I still believe, although I'm believing a little less, are character, character, character. <laughs> now, I see the Marvel pictures for the most part, and I see I see a fair amount of new movies. I don't see as many as I used to. I'm just not quite as passionate. But these films, the good ones, I mean, the Marvel pictures, they figured one thing out, and that's great characters portrayed by really good actors. And so you can sit and you can watch one of those pictures, and you're going to take something out of it. What mm-hmm. makes the Stranger Things so popular is, and this is this is true with a lot of television today, is that movies are need to be bigger because you have to you have to have something that's going to get get somebody's ass out of their recliner and away from their seventy inch TV right. and into a theater. They have to be bigger. This is not strangely enough. I mean, we've come full circle to the fifties when Daryl Zanuck you know, created CinemaScope, and he says, don't give me stories that are, are deeper. Give me stories that are wider. Hmm. But the popularity of television today is, uh, and pick, pick any show. I mean, uh, you know, Stranger Things, Godless, uh, House of Cards, uh, the, the Sopranos, Mad Men, everything. All of the great shows of today, and, and the bar is much higher than it used to be but the great shows of today are deeper and the audience gets attached to deep. Mm. The problem is you don't get deep in the theaters and people who are making movies for the theaters are not filmmakers. They are shooters who come from film school, who know how to put a picture. They know the vocabulary of movies very well, but there's no depth to the picture. Mm. There's no, there's nothing, there's no fingerprints that you feel on the movie. You know, I, I'm a child of the 70s, and every movie that came out in the 70s, one would say a so-and-so film. Right. You could feel their fingerprints on every frame of that celluloid. They had signatures. Think about think about it for a second. If a movie said a Sam Peckinpah film, mm-hmm. you, you know, know what you were in for. You know, a Don Siegel film, a Hal Ashby film, right. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, those movies were creations of essentially a person bringing it all back to Larry. When, when you see his card at the end of all of his movies and it says a Larry Cohen film, he wrote it, he produced it, he directed it, practically production managed it. It's a Larry Cohen movie. If you yeah. like it, blame Larry. If you hate <laughs> it, blame Larry, but it's Larry. Now, right. when you see a Marvel movie, I don't give a shit who directed it because it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's the bigger Kevin, machine. Kevin Feig, who runs Marvel Studios, is the director. You know, and he has an army around the world sitting at workstations making his movies, and they all look perfect. Right. And you know what? Perfect is boring. Yeah. You know, and that's why those movies work best for me when the character stuff is stronger and it's. You know, I, I got to tell you, the last Avengers movie, and I love the characters, but every time they were cut to an action sequence, I literally would tune out. Yeah, there's the climax of the picture when you're seeing two thousand heroes and two thousand aliens all charging one another, and you go, "Wow, that's really fantastic." I wonder how many people around the world worked on that. The jaundice that I bring, and this is me, you know, mm-hmm. just kicks right in. Whereas if you have a moment, say between two characters or the actors are touching something a bit deeper that you can't make in a computer. That's when those movies are good. Yeah. And that's why, you know, you, you know, when I see that girl, that little girl on Stranger Things, and I'm just going, she is world class. And she's not a world class child actor. She's world class, period. She, yeah. You know, because she is bringing you into her soul. Mm-hmm. And I know I'm getting real lofty and pretentious sounding, but, I just, I had these conversations and what happens is I just realized that what is being offered in movies today 
it's not the same as the movies that I've been watching my entire life. Yeah. And yet I can go see almost any movie and go, man, that was beautifully made. Mm-hmm. Beautifully executed, you know, and or that color correction system that they have, <laughs> you know, was great. And that, that digital makeup made that actor look a little bit better. Right. And by the way, I did that with my picture. You know, I did digital makeup passes on my, on my cast. You yeah, know, and I think it's pretty, it's pretty subtle. Um, you know, we played with, you know, color contrast. We played with, you know, color values and shots and stuff like that. There's no end to what you can do. Well, in the old days, they had to do it on the set. Mm-hmm. In, the old, in the old days, if, if the lens couldn't see it, it didn't exist. And for some reason, that, that's made a tremendous difference in movies today. So bringing all of this shit back to where we started about, you know, like, young filmmakers and having ideas and stuff like that. Uh-huh. You know, never lose sight of your original idea and do everything that you can to make it happen in a, in a deep and personal way. You know, um, and again, goes back to character. I got lucky with Larry. And then I continued to get lucky with you know, all the other people that I talked to. Yeah. Because, you know, at the end of the day, this is a movie about a certain character and he's an interesting character. Mm-hmm. That's the trick. If there's, if there's anything that anybody extracts from anything I've just said, you know, it all starts with character and, and hope that you get lucky enough. I mean, if you're doing my kind of movie, there are all kinds of documentaries where, you know, you, something about, uh, you know, a part of the world where they're having some sort of problems. But it still ultimately always goes back to who's, at, who's in that world at that time and going through that experience. Right. It all I think character is the one thing in storytelling fiction and nonfiction that never changes. And that's an important, that's the important consideration in the beginning. And then allow yourself to be surprised down the line. Mm-hmm. That's a great piece of advice. What was it like, or what did it take to get Larry on board? I mean, can you talk about how I'm sure you had to have a few meetings with him up front, but how did you kind of, how did you get him to agree to the picture? And what was it? How did you get him comfortable enough with you to put, you know, literally in a way his his life in your hands in terms of telling his story how did you get larry on board well when i was getting ready to do the crowdfunding thing i think at one point i said you know i ought to find out if this guy wants somebody to make a movie about him you know why go to the trouble of trying to get this thing on its feet if the subject doesn't want to be talked about so i was fortunate in that i knew someone who got me Larry's home phone number. And after a certain amount of deep breathing and coffee and, and turning my loins, you know, it's funny to make these cold calls sometimes. Yeah. I dialed the phone and it started to ring. And then, of course, you get very nervous. And then the phone gets picked up and then I hear, Oh! <laughs> and it's Larry on the phone and I'm going no assistance no explaining who I am to people who are going to say send me an email I just said hi I'm, I am who I am and I'm interested in doing this project and I, I was wondering if, if, how you would feel about doing it and he said you know come on over to the house <laughs> so I went to the famous house which was you know what's the old saying deja vu all over again right and, you know, I mean, I'm already, I'm walking through a set. It was, wow. it was pretty interesting. And, oh, yeah, that's where the guy fell off the roof in Black Caesar. And, oh, there's the pool when they did that. And then they shot the baby and it's alive too. That You know, mm-hmm. uh, so that was all running through my mind. And I knock on the door and he answers. You know, he doesn't have any help. You know, he's just his own guy, which, you know, as I came to realize, that's the way he works. DIY. And I said, I'm, I'm interested in doing this project. And he says, well, I'm very flattered. And he says, if you can get it financed, and obviously Larry knew something I didn't know. He says, and we can get started. I'll help you any way I can, which he was true to his word. And, uh, right from the get go, I mean, I didn't have to really sell him on it or persuade him on it. I didn't tell him, well, my vision of you is this. Well, you know, I, I, I've gotten a couple of reviews where people say that I didn't bring a lot of style to making the movie. And I kind of beg to differ because my style was, I let the subject be the style of the movie. You right. know, 
sometimes the best thing you can do as a storyteller is not get in the way. Yeah. That's interesting. And, and, you know, so I, I come again, a couple of those reviews, I'm going, well, what would you like me to have done? You know, change timeline, you know, done more smash cuts, you know, act like I'm, you know, like a raging maniac on yeah. coffee and vodka or something like that. It just gets distracted. You know, yeah, but I got a, the, the trick was to tell the story and not get in the way. Right. So other than that, you know, I didn't really have to persuade or, or, or seduce or, or massage Larry in any way. He just said, if you can get it financed. And then I tried, you know, getting it financed. And it took a while. I think from the initial meeting to when we finally got started, it took it took months. It took months. Before you were off to the races in, in production? Yeah. 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 It, it, it took months. And, uh, I mean, the Indiegogo campaign alone, you know, took a while. And, and it just, it, it just, that was awful at it. That was just awful. But... Once we got started, and I said hi, Larry, up. Oh yeah, okay, come on over. You know, and, yeah. and so we would go to the house, and we we did the first session. And literally, I mean, I used this phrase a lot. We were off to the races, mm -hmm. and then it was okay. Well, we're you know we're now you know getting stuff in the can, which was very gratifying. And then we had to start getting more stuff in the can. Not only, you know, more stuff with Larry, because like I said, I think get through all of my questions. But it took three days of session. And then we had to get everybody else. But yeah, once once we got started, Larry Larry just basically was, you know, uh, in, incredibly cooperative and, and worked with us and didn't give us a hard time about anything. He did give me, we did have we did have one screening where he gave me some notes and you know getting notes from Larry Cohen that's that's not a fun experience because he is blunt. <laughs> I think I said to his Cynthia uh, to his wife Cynthia one day he says he's blunt as a hammer isn't he and she says oh <laughs> yes he is. But other than that he was you know frankly he was he was he was a joy to work with i mean he didn't give us a hard time every once in a while he'd give me a hard time about a shot mm -hmm. you know when we shot that stuff down by the pool looking at the house you know what, what i call the citizen cane shot right you know, he goes oh that's that that's a good angle all right that's okay let's do this <laughs> you know and then he would give us a hard time about how long it would take for us to light you know, he would say, he says, oh, the time it takes you to light and I could have shot half a morning's worth of stuff. <laughs> and, and we weren't that slow, but, you know, he just, you know, he just, he just grabbed Great it. neck, yeah. That's hilarious. Um, I know we're coming up on time. So last few questions. There's so many okay. great quotes in the movie. I was writing them down after a while. It's like, there's so many great lines in this movie. Um what were the most compelling, Larry, either quotes or philosophies for you? Either personally well, or that you think are real centerpieces of the movie? Well, I think that that little bit at the end where he's saying you have to sort of believe in your movie and not let anybody tell you otherwise, I think was was a very key thing for me. I mean, again, you know, one of my best friends said to me, he said, do you think anybody gives a shit about Larry Cohen? Mm-hmm. And he knew who Larry was. He knew Larry's movies. And, you know, you just have to believe in yourself and you have to believe in your ideas. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, we, we will walk down, you know, we'll make a choice and we'll stick with it and we'll walk down the street and it doesn't work out. But I still believe that at the end of the day, you have to believe in what you're doing. Otherwise, right. it's too damn hard to run a marathon. Yeah. You know, this is a marathon and it's just, you got to do that. Um, boy, again, and, and I know, I know a lot of stuff that we didn't use, hmm. you know, great stories about what we did use, but you know, the thing about Larry is that he is fundamentally a fairly moral, uh, and truthful individual in the movie business. Right. And you know, that, kind of a rare breed in that regard as well mm -hmm. um i wish i wish there was a line that 
you know, had deeper meaning to me. I mean, some of his ideas have deep meaning to me. I mean, there's certain lines that just cracked me up all the time. You know, when when uh, Kai and I would be coming and Fred Williamson would go, that's a Larry myth. That's a Larry myth. <laughs> that always cracked me up. Then, uh, and for some reason, when Barbara Carrera is talking about Betty Davis, she goes, that's where we met Miss Davis, Betty Davis. <laughs> for some reason, that repetition always makes me smile. I mean, you, you know, you never know. I mean, I'll tell you one thing that's interesting uh, that, about my experience with this. When we took the picture to Montreal, to Fantasia, uh, that was our first uh, festival screening. And I felt pretty good about the picture. Enough, pe- enough people that I know and trust tell me the truth were saying, you know, they were saying how much they liked the picture. And I was feeling confident, not cocky, but confident. And I said, I think we'll be okay. And then 10 minutes before we were about to show the movie, the thought hit me, what if they don't like it? Because it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what Mm -hmm. my friends say, even though I trust their judgment. Mm -hmm. The audience is going to tell you if the movie is any good. The audience is going to tell you if the movie is funny. I mean, I think the movie, I didn't think the movie was, I didn't know the movie was as funny as it is until the audience started watching. That's interesting. I mean, I knew, I knew that we had a bunch of funny in there, but I didn't know it was that it was as funny. Right. And about, 10 minutes into the picture where I, I felt people were kind of laughing where I thought maybe they, they might find something funny or interesting or, or you know, worthy of a laugh. I was kind of hitting those beats. And then about a half, about 20 minutes, half hour into the picture. I can't remember exactly. Michael Moriarty, who was sitting in front of me turned and he goes, it's wonderful. It's just wonderful. And I'm going, okay, maybe <laughs> we're in good shape. <laughs> Um, it was, but you don't know. And, and I was talking about the Carl Gottlieb screenwriter of Jaws, who I met the other day at a screening of oh, wow. Cohen. And we were talking about the fact that the audience is the arbiter of everything. It doesn't matter what the critics think. It doesn't matter what your friends think. The audience will tell you if a movie is a good movie. And the cruel cool part of it is sometimes they'll take their time. And what I mean by that is the certain movies that have come out over my lifetime, when they first opened, audience did not go, or they didn't like the picture, right. or they decided they weren't interested in the movie. And now, those movies are incredibly beloved. The best example I can think of offhand is John Carpenter's thing. Right. Huge flop. Can you believe Huge that? Huge flop at the time. Yeah, well, and now it is considered, I mean, were to say what's the best horror movie ever made or the best science fiction horror movie ever made i know i would probably say john carpenter's the thing yeah easily done you know you know a movie like midnight run which was kind of successful but not unbelievably successful at the time is now one of the most popular movies ever made mm-hmm. Chopping mall i mean i don't want to make it about me but at the time we got shitty reviews and we did not get great uh box office and now, 30 years later, more or less, um, people tell me how much they love Chopping Mall. Yeah. Everybody who's seen Chopping Mall loves Chopping did Mall. Did that Did that end with, up on the, the Joe Bob show the, where that Shutter just did, the last drive-in? Was that one? I think that was answer, in the lineup. The answer is, I don't know. Okay. I hope so. Okay. I think I, I, I could swore so. I heard that it was in there. Okay. I know that it's on Amazon Prime. Okay. Uh and the new version of Ch- – and by the way, if you're a fan of the movie, I'll just say this, that Jim Wynorski and I found the movie, did a restoration uh, and a remastering on it. And we went back to the original camera elements, and then we also found the original mag track sound. And so now the movie is in its proper aspect ratio mm-hmm. wow. of 185. And the mix, even though it's a mono mix, is from the mag track. And so now the movie looks the way we shot it. Cause I shot nine days, of second unit on that. And I framed everything for one, eight, five. Although Roger wanted us to have a full open mat because it was going to be a direct video title. Right. And the, and the TV aspect ratio was different from theatrical, but we composed it for theatrical. And so now the mix, which is, was a two day mix, but it's a good mix 
has it's it's beefier. It's just got it's got more highs and lows. Oh, in that's it. great. And so, so now when you see it, you're seeing it the way we made it and the way we mixed it. Is that the so, version that's on yeah. Amazon? The version that's on Amazon. That's the version that's on the Blu-ray. Uh, uh, Lionsgate uh, on their Vestron video label put that out on Blu-ray, and I did a whole shitload of extras for that. Um, but it looks the way it's supposed to. Cool. And it makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's why I love Arrow Video. They take all these older movies and they make them look the way that they're supposed to. Yeah. I mean, I, I love labels like Arrow and, and Kino and, and, and you know, Seven. Shout slash Scream. They're doing a lot of great stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, if the, one thing that's great about living in, in the digital age is that old movies now have an opportunity to look the very best they've ever looked. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I don't know if you've noticed this, but you know, on MGM HD, they MGM owns the rights to most of the AIP library. And, you know, they'd be running some black exploitation movies that I may have seen back in the day. And you go, I didn't know this movie looked any good <laughs> because, you know, and Larry told me this, that, you know, a lot of AIP stuff was, was, uh, was processed at movie lab, which was the, uh, cheapest lab in town, and he used to say, "Yeah, they didn't change their baths or anything like that." So you could see an AIP movie, you know, from you know that was, you know, had color by Movie Lab on the first day, and it would kind of look like shit. Yeah. Well, now you see these movies because of the digital era. You can go back and scan from the negative, or you can scan from great elements, mm -hmm. and the movies will sort of look like the filmmakers intended them. I mean, in a sense. For, new, for old movies, you know, it, it's it's just a great time to, you know, to be a fan. Yeah, for sure. You know. um, okay, we got we got one more, two more. Got, let me see here. So, obviously, for filmmakers, there's so many resources out there. There's so many books that have been written and courses, and most of them are bullshit. They're done by people who you know, haven't really done it. Um, were there any resources, like books, or anything like that that were particularly helpful in getting this project off the ground? Well, getting this project off the ground, I don't think there were any books that were useful or helpful, but I'm, you know, a guy who's pretty film literate. And I tell you the best book, there are a couple of best books, you know, for writing, um, uh, the William Goldman book, which I am having a brain fart and I cannot remember the title. Oh my God. I can't believe that. Um, it, it'll come back to me, Okay. but, uh, William, William Goldman did a, 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 and I think it was a bestseller too, a book about screenwriting. Yeah. I is, think I have it. I forgot what it's called. Too. I'm sure you do. <laughs> everybody, everybody does. The other book that's great is Sidney Lamette's making movies. Oh yeah. You want to know, <laughs> you want to know how to make movies, read that book. Speaking of Carl Gottlieb. One of the great. Sorry. Go what's ahead. that? I have since speaking of Carl Gottlieb, I just got his Jaws book, which is about the making of Jaws. You know, it's funny you mention that because when I met Carl the other day, I told him I read the book when it first came out. And he says, oh, we, I've done an upgrade. You know, you want a copy of it? I go, yeah. He says, I got one in the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks he goes beautiful. Down, he, gets me, he gets me a copy of the Jaws log, the latest version of the Jaws log, and he signs it to me, which is very lovely of him. And, I'm about two thirds of the way through it, and oh, cool. that's a great book. That's great. I mean, I'm rereading it, but it's like it's all brand new to me all these decades later. Mm -hmm. But that's a great book to read about how shit goes wrong. Right. You know, Jaws, the movie, is one of the best movies ever made. I mean, if you're going to make a top ten list, my guess is almost everybody would put Jaws oh, in, yeah. in, in, in on the list. What's great about Jaws, the movie behind the movie, the story behind the movie is almost as good as the movie itself because, you know, you know Murphy's Law, right? Everything mm -hmm. that can go wrong will go wrong, et cetera. Right. Jaws is the master class of Murphy's Law. That yeah. so much went wrong. And these were smart people, experienced people, you know, people who knew what they were doing, craftsmen, you know, they had years of doing all of this stuff none of it mattered and the thing that's so fascinating to me about that story behind the movie is in spite of everything going wrong the movie turned out to be as great as it is yeah 
It still holds up today. I you saw know. it about two weeks ago. The shark looks amazing. Every it's a perfect movie. Yeah. I said to, I asked Carl. I said, Carl, you know, I love the phony shark because it feels more like a monster. Yeah. You know, it doesn't feel like a fish. It feels like a monster. Said, but what do you think of it? You know, seeing you know, and the shark for the most part looks very good and it's very well cut. Uh, and he said, well, the only time it bothered me is the mouth bothered me a little bit when it was opening and closing. And, and he said, but other than that, yeah, I liked it as much as you did. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there are any other books. Um, oh, Adventures in the Screen Trade is the name of William Goldman's book. Okay, Adventures great. in the Screen Trade. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a, you know, f- from a writing standpoint, it doesn't get a whole lot better than that. Okay. Um, but. You know, the thing is, to, to be a filmmaker on any level, I think it's just good to be to have absorbed everything you can get your hands on. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think that if you're a young filmmaker and you want to be in this business, don't think because you can take your smartphone out and make a movie, you can make a movie. You have to know something about art and life. And, te- and technology, to me, kind of comes down the line. I mean, I'm not overly technologically uh, brilliant or wise because it doesn't matter because I'm the director. It's important for me to know how to get it on its feet. It's important for me to know what to go after and get. It's important for me to have an idea about how it should be photographed and lit, Mm -hmm. but I don't necessarily have to do it. And it's important for me to understand how editing works so I can, so I can, you know, cut. And then, you know, to have taste when it comes to music, hopefully. Those are the more important things. Yeah. There's always going to be somebody who you can say, hey, Bill, what lens do you think we should use for this right. shot? Hey, Charlie, how was the sound on that? Did you, did you, hear, did you hear that plane off in the distance? Mm-hmm. Those people are all there to make you happy as a filmmaker. And, you know, Sidney Lumet, again, who is one of my you know, personal gods, I'm a big fan of his. And I wish I had met him. God, I wanted to meet him. Mm. He was one of the few guys I wanted to meet more than anybody else. Um, you know, he said that at the end of the day, remember, you're the boss. Right. You get all the credit or you get all the blame. You know, and mm-hmm. he says it's a, very, you know, it's a very heady place to be, but don't abuse it. Because right. there's so so many things that can go wrong, and you're going to take you're going to take heat for it. So respect the people who know more than you do. I know what I don't know. Yeah, and I think that's an important thing for any filmmakers: know what you don't know, but also know what you do know. Right, and know what you need to know to go out and do your jobs. Like I said before, if some if someone who is going to take a look at this interview and and say, I want to make I want to make my King Cullen. That's an egocentric thing for me to say, but you know what I mean. Uh huh. They need to know how to go out and get the material to do the physical making of the picture. You know, being a good journalist, being a good being a good uh, interviewer, and listening very key. You know, I learned how to interview basically by reading you know the old Playboy magazine interviews back in the day. They were the gold standard. Hmm. Watching guys like Charlie Rose. When he was on the air, he was an excellent interviewer. You know, Bob Costas used to have a show a long time ago, late at night, and Bob Costas was an extraordinarily well prepared interview. I think he has a photographic memory, frankly. Helps. Because he, he always has, you know, so many uh, you know, uh, stats and, and, and things at his fingertips. But he was a good interviewer. And I think the trick to being a good uh, documentary filmmaker is to be a good interviewer but also know how to sort of, you know, see what you need to see as in life as it, as it, uh, as, as it's presented to you. I mean, even Ken Burns takes these grand historical events. I mean, my favorite movie of his is, is the movie made about the Brooklyn bridge because I'm insane about the Brooklyn bridge. I love the Brooklyn bridge. It's the most remarkable piece of architecture on the planet, but, you can do a you can do a movie just about that, and it's not going to be as interesting as the movie about the guy who designed it and fought to get it built. And you know, again, going back to character. Mm-hmm. So all of this is very simple and very hard at the same time. 
Yeah. As I'm saying it, I'm realizing it. Right. So any uh, final thought, final question you wanted to ask me? Sure. Last question. Any tips on how to best pitch a documentary project to producers? How to... Uh, if there's a best way to do it, I'm not the guy. Uh, I do think just in general with pitching, the less you say is usually the better. Hmm. And um, because if you start to explain it, they have a chance to lose their place. Interesting. Okay. Uh, you should you should find an idea. Um, and if you use the paradigm, this is a story about a guy who you're coming at a place from character so people can relate to that. I think that applies to nonfiction as well as fiction. But clearly you have to have, and, and pitching is pitching. I don't think documentary pitching is any different than, than fiction pitching, yeah. except you want to you you want to bait them, you know, and you want to hook them enough for them to start asking you questions. If they're just sitting there and, and if they're just sitting there and they're politely listening, you're dead. <laughs> and if you and if you and if you speak too long, you're dead. Because most people, like I said, and we're circling back to the beginning of this interview, everybody has ADD, right. And if you're sitting in an office, your your the magnetic pull of your smartphone is greater than the stranger in front of you, most of the time. So if you're the stranger in front of that guy on the or, or gal on the other side of the desk, you got to hook up. You got to say, you know, I want to do a movie about blah blah. In the case of my partner Matt, all I had to say was Larry Cohen, and I was boom, we were off to the races. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's another thing. I try to identify who you're trying to produce the movie for or with. Okay. You know, I don't think you can go to PBS and say that you want to do a Herschel Gordon Lewis biography. Yeah, I don't you think know. that would fly very well. Now, yeah, Herschel Gordon Lewis, might, who might be intrinsically interesting on some level, is not going to fly for that audience. Right. The flip side is if you were going to go to Shudder and pitch something and, you know, you say, I want to do something about James Whale, which might actually be sort of in their wheelhouse. It's it's such an antique idea that no one's going to know who you're talking about. Right. So I think the trick is have an idea who you're pitching to and have an idea about how's the best way to communicate your idea in the quickest way possible. All right. Great. Steve, this was, uh, this was a whole lot of fun and extremely uh, informative. Thank you. Thank you again. It was, this was a real oh, blast. It, so thanks. My, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, this was, uh, this was fun for me too. I was, you know, I did, I did one earlier today and it, it was fine. I mean, because I'm also, you know, here's, here's the trick. A guy who does what I do, I know how to make me sound pretty interesting. <laughs> because it's half the I'm job. in the business of making people sound interesting. Right, right. Uh, but I didn't have to work hard at, 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 at your job today. So, you know, kudos to you. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, congrats on King Cone. It was uh, it was a real it was, it was a real treat. And thanks again for that screen. Tell everyone you meet from now until the end of time to go see it. I will, I will. Go. Steve, thanks again. Oh, Nick, it was great. Thanks so much. I enjoyed it. All right, all right, all right. So let's wrap this thing up with Steve Mitchell's three tips for documentary filmmakers. First and foremost, learn how to interview. This might sound really, really obvious for documentarians, but being a good documentary filmmaker means being a good interviewer. Learn from the best. Steve recommends Playboy interviews. You can get on Amazon, you can get compilations of them throughout the course of decades, all in a single volume. And uh, having read the Hugh Hefner biography, I learned how much painstaking work goes into researching guests before they do these interviews. And you can really tell when you read them. They are really articulate and they're really specific and they somehow are able to make the guests feel at ease, which is a really huge part of being a good interviewer. These are some skills I'm trying to learn myself as I continue with this podcast. But um, yeah, Playboy interviews. Steve also recommends, despite recent news, old Charlie Rose interviews as well. 
Number two, characters are everything. The secret to doing any effective storytelling is great characters, even in a nonfiction documentary. So make sure your documentary has a strong central character and then use his life story to illustrate the many sides of his character. Steve mentioned that when he wanted to document the making of each of the movies, he focused on how those movies shed more light on Larry. So he utilized the movies to further dimensionalize the character of Larry Cohen because in each case there were stories about the making of the movie that just shed a light more of a light on Larry Cohen and provided you a little piece of information about him that you may not have known. He utilized the movies as a vehicle for doing that instead of doing this kind of retrospective on all of these movies. All of the the purpose of utilizing those movies was, first of all, obviously, to do a retrospective on those movies, but he very specifically wanted to make sure that they all shed further light on Larry. So all roads lead back to your characters, even in documentaries. Number three, boredom equals death. Documentary filmmaking is a marathon, not a sprint, which is why it's critically important to choose a subject that you will be interested in long term. Without sustained enthusiasm, a project is really in danger. Steve talked about how long this movie took to make and any sort of film project is just riddled with complications and these things take a long, long time. You can't start a project on a topic that you will not have sustainable enthusiasm for because it could take a few years and it is grueling and without that passion, your project is definitely in danger. Anyway, guys, King Cohen is not only a ton of fun, very entertaining, but it's quintessential viewing for any aspiring filmmaker. Definitely recommend you check it out. You can buy the Blu-ray at www.lalalandrecords.com, and it's got over an hour and 15 minutes worth of never-before-seen bonus footage. Definitely recommend you check it out. Anyway... Thank you guys so much for listening. I do hope you got a lot out of this interview. And uh, let me know on Twitter what your favorite part was and or if any of these keys to filmmaking particularly resonated with you. I would love to hear. Also, don't forget to subscribe on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And you can follow the show on the Instagrams at I'm Nick Taylor. That's I am Nick Taylor. Same handle on Twitter. And let me know what you think. I look forward to hearing from you guys. Thanks.